This is kind of amazing to me, actually, but we are celebrating the 50th anniversary this year of our Second Vatican Council. It's, it's incredible. Where does time go, right? All right, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but I sort of am. If you were born before Vatican II, raise your hands nice and high. Okay. I'd say about half of you, okay? <clears throat> Where does the time go, right? <laughs> 50 years. This past week, we had uh, one of four conversations that we're going to be having um, with folks about what if impact Vatican II had on us as a church. And uh, on Tuesday in this conversation, we had a number of folks show up for this. And certainly, as you can imagine, people began with the liturgy, right? So once upon a time, we were facing that way. I'm talking about the priests with our backs to you. We were speaking in Latin, right? And if you recall, the feeling of church was something kind of mysterious and formal. And if I'm not mistaken, you know better than me, a little frightening for some. <laughs> I hear some laughs, right? So a gentleman came up to me, and I would say he's probably in his um, late 70s, he was from Brooklyn, has been a transplant here to this area in Syracuse, and he said, Father, I really want to understand what happened, right? What was the backstory? I really want to know about what happened to God, right, in Vatican II. I said, what do you mean what happened to God in Vatican II? Well, he said, you know, it used to be that Jesus, and I'd have to say, he said, we never called him Jesus our Lord, or Christ, was up there, right? And he was so far above everything that we needed Mary and we needed the saints just to have a conversation with him, right? We went through them in order to have a conversation with him. We never would address him directly. And he said, you know, I have to say, he said, it all felt a little bit more clear back then, right? Because we were afraid of God, we wouldn't think of not going to Mass. We wouldn't think of coming without doing our fast, right? We wouldn't think, without, think of coming to Mass without confession. Um, he said, it all seemed a little bit more clear. He said, Vatican II rolls around, and all of a sudden we're calling our Lord Jesus, and we're emphasizing His humanity, as if He's our brother or something, right? He also says, and when did God develop this kind of soft, fuzzy side? <laughs> because in Vatican II, it seems all we talk about is God's love. It used to be, you know, the wrath of God. It's interesting. But then at the end of that sort of brief uh, lead up, he said, I just want you to level with me. Is God divine or is he human? I thought that's kind of an interesting question. What's wrong with that question? I hear somebody saying it over here. A little bit louder. Come on. He's both, exactly. Right? Divine and human. For some reason, I have a Reese's peanut butter cup thinking, you know, <laughs> popping into my head. Chocolate and peanut butter. Divine and human, right? Divine and human. There's something really powerful about that. It's not an either-or proposition. Why do we need Jesus to be both fully divine and fully human? We've actually believed this for about 1,500 years, since the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. Chalcedon, which is currently Istanbul. At that council, the 300 and some odd folks who were assembled there verified that this is our belief, fully human, fully divine. His divine nature does not cancel out his human nature, and nor does his human nature cancel out his divine nature. In fact, think about it a little bit like the charges on a battery. There's a positive end and a negative end, and you need them both in order for the energy of that battery to make things work. Well, in a sense, Jesus, too, has that divine and human quality to him. And in fact, it's through his humanity that we discover what divinity is about. In fact, 
part of the challenge, I think, that this gentleman was expressing is if Jesus was up here, we didn't have to worry about really imitating him, being like him, growing in his image and likeness. But if Jesus is my brother or my sister, right, all of a sudden he's not so far away, not so distant. And his challenge to follow him hits home, right, in a different way because he's calling each of us to become divine like he is. It might sound almost heretical, but in fact it's true. Jesus is inviting us to become divine as he does through his own humanity. In the reading from uh, Isaiah today, when Jesus himself was trying to understand his nature and who he was in relationship to his Father, this passage from Isaiah, became the blueprint for him. He he began to see himself as the suffering servant, the one who would be obedient to God, ultimately even to death, the one who would be a prophet for God's love, even in the face of all resistance, suffering, and cruel death. This passage helped him to understand somehow what he would do. And in this this reading from Hebrews, we understand that Jesus' humanity is the way in which God understands our frailty, our weaknesses, our limits, and really has fullness of compassion and mercy for us. It's so essential, Jesus' humanity, just as his divinity is. When we reflect tonight on what claim this makes on us, we might consider for a moment these two wonderful women saints that we're celebrating this weekend in Rome. Marianne Cope, she lived in this place. Someone came out of Mass earlier today and said, my gosh, I grew up in the same neighborhood she did. He said, it's kind of freaky, right? Why did you say it's freaky? He said, well, she walked in these places. She, she ate, you know, in this place, and she knew these people, and well, I know those same people, like, and their children, and their children's children. It somehow makes a claim on us that sainthood and holiness are not so distant from us, right? And Gattery Tekakwitha, what an amazing story. I mean, when I read her story, I move to tears because of her faith and courage. If you don't know her story, pick up the Catholic uh, reporter this weekend. It's a powerful story of how she stood up in the face of so much resistance because Christ had spoken so deeply in her heart, and she wanted to follow. She traveled 200 miles through perilous circumstances to join a Christian community near Montreal. It was my own forebearers, the Jesuits, who baptized her and and instructed her in the faith, and they recognized her sainthood before she even died. My friends, as we consider today the claim that Christ makes on us in his divinity and his humanity, we too are being called to holiness through the fullness of our humanity by embracing our own weaknesses, by putting aside our egos, even in the big and small ways that our relationships call us to, by giving ourselves more generously to our community by identifying needs like Mary Ann Cope did and saying, yes, in my own way, I can do some small part for that need. Even here in this community, I am so amazed at how awesome it is that you guys travel to be here from all these different places around this city. You want to be here. And now that you're here, what might you desire to give to this community that it becomes even more your home? 